It is almost unimaginable to be found guilty in a court of law for a crime you did not commit. Or imagine knowing you were innocent, but you pled guilty anyway because that seemed like the best option. Kent Roach is a professor at the University of Toronto's Faculty of Law and co-founder of the Canadian Registry of Wrongful Convictions. His new book catalogues the myriad ways that Canada's justice system makes such cases more common than you might think. It's called Wrongfully Convicted, Guilty Pleas, Imagined Crimes, and What Canada Must Do to Safeguard Justice. And Kent Roach joins us now here in the studio. It's good to see you again. Good to see you. Thank Steve. you for joining us. Okay, give us the numbers. Uh, I think I read in your book there's something like 187,000 cases before uh, courts in this country every year. How many of them do they get wrong? Well, we never know, but at the registry, we launched with 83 cases of wrongful convictions. And now we have four more that we're adding. So we're gonna be up to 87, but it's only the tip of the iceberg because these only measure remedied wrongful convictions. So if, if you assume that the legal system gets it right 99.5% of the time. That's a big assumption. That's a big assumption. Mm -hmm. But even then, there'd be 900 wrongful convictions each year, about 400 of those who would go to jail. So this is truly the proverbial tip of the iceberg that we're finding out about. It is, and it's an access to justice issue. In the end, how many people who are wrongly convicted do you think end up inside a jail cell? Well, I mean, given that, I would expect that it's probably less than 50%, but I think people that just get a, a, a conditional sentence or whatever, they often don't have the resources to remedy their wrongful conviction. I mean, if you and I had a conviction because it would affect our employment status and all that, we would spend the farm on it. But if you already have a couple of convictions and, and you get another one that's wrongful, I think most people just lump it. Well, that does raise a question about what particular groups in society may have a tougher time getting access to justice and, and you know, the benefit of the doubt and all of that than others. Who would they be? Well, you know, Indigenous people, they're 16 out of the 83. And uh, you can look at that one of two ways. You could say that's overrepresentation from the 5 or 6% in the population, but it's not representing the fact that over a third of prisoners in Canada, the most serious wrongful convictions, uh, are people that are in jail. Similarly, we have about uh, four black people, and we're adding two more uh, black parents to the list soon. And we hasten to add, this is just the ones you know of that are on your registry. Exactly. It's not the sum total of everything. Exactly. Because we assume there's a lot more. Exactly. And if you look south of the border, you know that with American exonerations, about 60% of them are black people, even though only about 30% of the prison population is black. I, I, I mean, I, look, at this is my impression. You tell me if I'm wrong. My impression is there's not a lot of energy or effort right now in the official justice system to kind of do anything about that. And I'm not, uh, you know, laying blame here because so much of what happens in the justice system is just designed to get through the day, right? Get, exactly. court, get cases in, get them out, get them dealt with and so on. Why does so much of this so easily fall under the radar? Couple of reasons. We haven't had a public inquiry into a wrongful conviction since 2008. We haven't had clear-cut DNA exonerations, you think of Guy Paul Moran, David Milgard, those will eventually go away because in the minority of cases, and it's only about 20% of cases, will involve biological evidence. The police will do their job and collect it, and if it's not, if, if it's not the person, they're going to go free. And then finally, and, and while I was writing this book, um, I think the decline of investigative journalism. So much of the registry is built. I mean, we only look at publicly available documents. We don't want to contact people. We don't want to, uh, you know, harm people. We're a university. We have to abide by human subjects review. So, so much of our work was really done looking not only at court documents, which often don't tell the whole story, but media stories. And I've seen less and less investigative reporting. I mean, there's still people, Rachel Mendel, 
Nicholson at the Toronto Star has done wonderful work. Of course, the late Tracy Tyler, Kirk Macon. But now most newspapers don't have the resources to devote someone to the long slog of uncovering a wrongful conviction. You mentioned Kirk Macon, whom I know, but I mean, Kirk hasn't been at the Globe and Mail in... I don't know, 20 years? Exactly. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's... You know, and, 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 and Kirk went on to serve on the board of Innocence Canada, so he felt strongly uh, uh, about this. So there are some people. We also spent a lot of time looking at regional and APTN, because APTN has done, I think, a much better job... Aboriginal People's Television. Aboriginal Network. People's Television, uh, covering the wrongful convictions of Clayton Boucher, Connie Oakes. These should be household names. Unfortunately, I don't think they are. Right. Let's do an excerpt from your book. We all think dirty to some extent. The presumption of innocence and giving people the benefit of a reasonable doubt are fundamental legal principles, but they are also psychological and social fictions. As the cartoon Pogo recognized with respect to pollution in 1970, we have met the enemy and he is us. We all can believe that untrue and imagined crimes are real crimes. Okay, let's pick this apart a bit. An imagined crime, what's that? An imagined crime is a crime that didn't happen. So I worked as director of research in the Gouge Commission and we were looking at the Charles Smith cases. Stephen Gouge is a judge who was in charge of looking into all of this. And Charles Smith is yeah. a disgraced pathologist who said, you know, these people died, uh, these babies died deliberately uh, as a result of foul play. When other pathologists looked at it, they said, no, these ba babies died because of epilepsy or because of undetermined causes. Mm -hmm. So an imagined crime is when suspicion that we often have then generates into a conviction or a guilty plea. How much of that happens because people have uh, preconceived prejudices about uh, ethnicities of people and that kind of thing? I think some of it does. I mean, you know, with Charles Smith, the three men uh, that were victims were all racialized. One was indigenous, one was a, uh, Dinesh Kumar, a new immigrant from India, and Onal Blackett. Uh, I also think, though, and this is a more delicate subject, it also comes sometimes in sexual assault cases, is that, you know, thinking dirty about men is not an irrational thing. We know that men commit most sexual uh, assaults, but it can also lead to this kind of shortcut where we just view things through the lens of guilt and don't give the weight we should to the evidence that suggests the person is not guilty. Is there a distinction between imagined crime and a who done it. Absolutely. So the who done it is Guy Paul Moran, uh, David Melgard. It's it's you know clear that a crime has been committed and we get the wrong person. And I kind of you know this still happens. The Glenn Assoon case I talk about is a who done it where we never found out who actually did it. But one of my worries and why I've I've really put the emphasis on guilty pleas and imagined crimes is the who done it can very soon become Netflix entertainment. Hmm. Right, They really follow the ideas we have from mystery novels, mystery movies. And of course, these are not entertainment. This is about a lot of human suffering, not only for the wrongfully convicted, but their whole family. What do you mean by the phrase, thinking dirty, about the criminal justice system? Well, thinking dirty was coined about Charles Smith because there was an attempt to try to deal with undetected child abuse and that was a real reason but I say we all think 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 dirty because one of the problems is we sometimes uh, pathologize what are actually really common causes of wrongful conviction so we can say you know thinking dirty that was Charles Smith once Charles Smith has gone there there's no more problems well that's not true similarly we talk about tunnel vision and we're hard on the police about tunnel vision but I explain tunnel vision to my students that if I'm reading a three question exam and the first the first question is not done very well I'm thinking, okay, well, maybe this one's going to be a C that I can put on my curve. But at least I recognize that, right? I mean, it, it's a, just a human tendency because we have too much stuff coming in our brains. We have to simplify it. In a way, and again, you tell me if I'm out in left field on this one, but in a way, it is a bit of a public endorsement of how much confidence they have in the whole criminal justice system that we assume the police wouldn't lay charges if there weren't something there. 
the courts wouldn't find somebody guilty if they weren't because we have such faith in our judges. We believe in the jury system. I mean, that's all part of it, isn't it? Absolutely. And of course, the jury system is something where, you know, we have problems with the diversity of, of, of juries. We don't allow reporters to talk to jurors. I mean, there was a recent case in Ontario where one of the jurors went on a shock jock after and kind of spilled the beans about some of his homophobic attitudes. And you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to do that. Yeah. But that uh, actually, that counts in our view as a wrongful conviction because, you know, we don't judge innocence because the legal system doesn't. That was a case where he was convicted and then it was undone as a result of new evidence about what that juror, juror number 12, said to the shock mm. jock. I'm gonna go a little off the path here because you've taken me down an alley I wanna just pursue for a second. In the States, you're, if you're on a jury, you're allowed to talk. In fact, if you're on the OJ jury, you're gonna get a five book deal or something yes. like that. But in Canada, our tradition is you're on a jury, everything stays in the jury room, you do not, you don't explain, you don't defend, you don't do anything uh, for members of the public. Which do you prefer? I, I prefer the American. I mean, the American Supreme Court uh, has allowed uh, convictions to be overturned when there was evidence of racist stereotyping going on in the jury. Our Supreme Court in the Penn case reached the ultimate, the opposite result. And usually our Supreme Court is much more liberal than the American Supreme Court, much more kind of pro-accused. But this is an area where I think we're uh, protecting the justice system. And, and, and that's one of the problems with wrongful convictions is no one likes to admit mistakes. And so a lot of wall go up and this is why we describe it as a long hard climb to exoneration so we use the the mountain both to represent the tip of the iceberg but the fact that it takes a lot longer to reverse a wrongful conviction than it takes for a wrongful conviction to occur and in a guilty plea case literally the wrongful conviction can take place 10 minutes in court time someone's looking at a murdered sentence, looking at mandatory life imprisonment, which is still constitutional in Canada. They're offered a deal to manslaughter, infanticide. You gotta have a lot of faith in the justice system to roll the dice. And most people will actually accept the plea to infanticide or manslaughter. Okay, let me pick up on that then. How much in your judgment, you've looked at this system for a very long time, how much of that happens where somebody is going to plea bargain down and accept a false conviction? They may not be guilty, but they're going to accept that because there's so much momentum in the system to clear cases and you're afraid that uh, if you don't do this, you could spend 25 years to life in jail. Yeah, it happens, I think, every day in our justice system. Every day. And it happens both in small cases and in big cases. So an example of a small case, we talk about Clayton Boucher. Clayton Boucher was denied bail on a drug charge. And he was given a, an idea to, he could plead guilty, get time served. He served about two, three months in the Edmonton Remand Center. Quite a scary place. He pled guilty, even though he knew it wasn't drugs, and the RCMP lab eventually said it wasn't drugs. Now, he made a rational decision. That's the little case. Big case is the murder, murder cases. If, if, you know, if you're a battered woman and you're charged with murder, and they offer you a manslaughter and all of the abuse that you've suffered goes into maybe you don't even go to jail. Or like Maria Shepard, uh, one of Charles Smith's victims, she gets to stay in the provincial system. She doesn't go and have to sit with Carla Homolka in prison for women. She makes a rational decision that's best for her family. So not only is it irrational decisions, it's rational decisions. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, you know, one of the things in the book is I talk about, you know, I've been doing teaching criminal law for 35 years now. I have to say I'm a little more disillusioned than I was at the start. I partly noticed because that. You this. mentioned that in the book about how you, you, I mean, the longer you've been at this, the less optimistic you are about the future. Yeah. That's sad. It is sad. It, it, it is sad. But I think a lot of us, as we get older and we see the same mistakes happening. But having said that, I mean, I'm not completely disillusioned. And there's a bill before Parliament that I hope gets enacted before the next election. I'm not so sure uh, that could make things a bit better. This was really the striking thing about the David Milgard case, which many people may remember. We're going back 30 years now. 
Um, the indigenous fella who was alleged to have committed a murder went to jail, found guilty, went to jail. They offered him uh, like a plea to get out, right, to manslaughter. They, they said, you plead guilty to manslaughter, you can get out for time served. And he wouldn't do it. Yep. He wouldn't take it. He insisted, I'm innocent and I'm going to stay here until the system gets it right. Yep. How much of that happens? Well, I mean, it happened for Donald Marshall. It happened for Bill Mullins Johnson. It happened for Tammy Marquardt. They're all indigenous people. They all uh, gambled, uh, had faith in the system, and were all wrongfully convicted of murder. And so, you know, as a person who is part of the system, who teaches this, I, I feel that that's a problem that we all need to take very seriously. Mm. Here we go, back to the book here. Uh, Sheldon, top of page four for this quote. The range of potential wrongful convictions is larger than we previously presumed. We can no longer assume that those who plead guilty are actually guilty. We also cannot assume that DNA evidence will solve the whodunit mysteries associated with our infamous wrongful convictions. We can't even assume that there was a crime. Given this reality, we'd better make sure we invest in the back end of the justice system to ensure that we correct our mistakes as quickly, humanely, and fully as possible. Okay, the back end of the justice system refers to what? Well, it refers to post-conviction relief. It refers to appeals. It refers to now getting mercy from the Minister of Justice, the Federal Minister of Justice, when all your appeals are, are, are gone, and it refers to compensation. How inclined or not are justice ministers to get involved when they are asked to, to deal with what could be perceived as a misjust, uh, an injustice in the system? Well, I think it depends on the Minister of Justice, Erwin Kotler, and now his uh, McGill colleague, uh, David Lametti, I think have pretty good reputations for making decisions sometimes quickly to order new trials and new appeals. Other justice ministers, not so much. Uh, again, I'm going to infer here, you tell me if I'm wrong. You've just mentioned two capital L liberal justice ministers. Is it harder for a capital C conservative justice minister to do what you've suggested because they are seen, part of their brand is tough on crime? I think so. And in the 2019 election, there were uh, um, agreements by the NDP, the Liberal and the Green Party to enact an independent commission to take the Minister of Justice's place. But I note the Conservative Party did not make that agreement. And so for me, one of the urgencies is if this Bill C-40 before Parliament, if it dies on the order paper before we all go trotting off to an election, and if there's a change in government, I'm not so sure it's going to be revived under a Conservative government. I hope so. I hope I'm proven wrong. But um, that's that's what I observe. You'd love to see this happen. Where is where is this in the sort of parliamentary calendar right now? Well, David Lametti has made it a priority. He's gotten a $19 million budget for the commission. I'm, I'm not sure that's enough, but it, it does show, and I believe Minister Lametti wants it. But it's only at first reading, and the clock is ticking, and there's a lot of justice bills in the line before that. Yeah, clock's ticking, but this parliament has lasted longer than anybody thought it would, and, and you know, I think they've got a supply and confidence agreement for another couple of years, so theoretically, that's enough time to get it done. Yeah, no, and but, you know, again, this goes back to the dis disillusionment. I was the research director for Justice Harry LaForm and Winita westmoreland Chiori in 2021 when they did public consultations, and we talked to the exonerated, we talked to the commissions that exist in England and four other countries. And, you know, one of the disillusioning things is one of the things that's happened in England is they've starved the commission of funds. And if the commission doesn't have the necessary funds, they can't do the necessary outreach, they can't do the necessary investigations, and they also can't support the wrongful, wrongfully convicted as they go through this long process of trying to get justice. You've got a website that's got all of this there. We should just tell everybody, wrongfulconvictions.ca. 
Your students are involved in this too, right? Yes. What do they do? Well, the students uh, donate their time. And we started this in 2018. Amanda Carling and I uh, were teaching uh, wrongful convictions together. She's a former student of mine, a Métis woman who worked four years for Innocence Canada. And we noticed that, you know, the Americans have a registry, the English have a registry, where's the Canadian registry? So we thought it was a one-year project turned out to be a five-year project and we're still kind of working on it. But the idea is you can go there, you can read about the 83, soon the 87 cases. We also have a timeline of injustice because I think for Amanda, especially as a Métis person, it was important to you know include Louis Riel uh, and other people in that. And so we hope that it's a source, not only for law students and, and researchers, but high school students and, and the public at large. And, and it's free, so you don't have to buy the book. You can just go to the website. But the book is kind of uh, the greatest hits from the registry. I was going to say, don't tell your publisher that you've just <laughs> offered the option of our viewers not to buy your book. But anyway, OK, so we've got wrongfulconvictions.ca. You've got the commission, the idea of a commission, uh, an independent commission before Parliament right now that you hope gets through. Uh, what else? One more idea that you'd like to see happen to improve the situation. Compensation. So uh, Justice Laforme and Westmoreland Triori recommended no fault, quick compensation so people can get on their feet. The wrongfully convicted get less support than those who get parole, and that's not included in the bill. The other thing that's not included in the bill, and I think politics is one of the reasons, is they recommended, what about sentencing? What about you're not wrongfully convicted, but your sentence is based on the wrong facts, right? Mm. In New Zealand, they have a new commission with uh, two Maori and one Pacific Islander commission. Their first case they referred to was back to the courts saying, you thought this kid was 17 when you sentenced him. Actually, we think he was 15, hmm. and we think that makes a difference. Hmm. I have one last question for you, which is, it is a big justice system out there. There are myriad issues to care about. Do you know why you care about this one in particular so much? Well, I think that I couldn't think of a more alienating uh, being alone if I was wrongfully accused of a crime. And early in my career, I appeared before Justice Fred Kaufman, and it was my first appearance, and he was very kind to me. And when I read his autobiography, I realized that he was interned as an enemy alien when he fled Vienna one step in front of Hitler. Mm. And, and, and to me, that was a real lesson. And so people like Fred Kaufman, people like the late Mark, Mark Rosenberg, who cared about these, are people that I look up to. And, and I just think, you know, the wrongfully convicted need some allies. And like Jerry Garcia said, it's probably, uh, you know, it's pathetic that it has to be me. <laughs> Lucky for them, it is you. Wrongfully convicted, guilty pleas, imagine crimes, and what Canada must do to safeguard justice. And we're glad it has brought Kent Roach to our studio tonight on TVO. Kent, thanks so much. Thank you very much, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.